again, in a city of 146 zip codes, but we need to focus a whole lot of resources, and we are in those areas, particularly the Test and Trace Corps, Department of Health, front and center with a large number of personnel right now. We'll go into those details. What we are finding initially is the more there is communication with members of the community about the importance of wearing masks, the more there's free mask distribution, and obviously a sense that there are consequences to not wearing masks, the more we are seeing people uh, pick up on that and wear masks, and that's gonna be part of how we turn the situation around. Let me go into that, and then you're gonna hear from Dr. Katz, but first I wanna talk about our daily indicators as we did yesterday, I think it's important to give this update up front, and there are some important uh, insights in these indicators, so I wanted you to hear them as we begin. So uh, daily indicator number one, daily number of people admitted to New York City hospitals for suspected COVID-19. Threshold is 200 patients. Today's report, 87, with a confirmed positive rate of COVID for COVID of just under 9%. Uh, number two, new reported cases on a seven-day average. The threshold is 550 cases, and today's report is 354. Number three, percentage of people testing positive citywide for COVID, threshold of 5%. Now, again, this is the citywide number. Today's report, 0.94%. And we are now also going to be talking about the seven-day rolling average. So you have that perspective. Today, the seven-day rolling average number is 1.46%. So that's the citywide picture. This is the first of probably several times I will say today. It is so important for everyone to go out and get tested. We need to get a very clear picture of what is happening around the city. We need to get a very clear picture of what's happening in these nine key zip codes and several others we're concerned about. The answer, as it has been from the beginning, testing, testing, testing. The more people get tested, the better picture we get. We make sure we're seeing, uh, based on a bigger sample size, what's going on. So again, if you have not been tested in a while or never been tested, we need you to go get tested. Obviously, if you have symptoms, we need you to go get tested. Free, quick, uh, easier than ever. So this is the key to us addressing this situation. As always, the more people get tested, the better. Now let's talk about the neighborhoods. Uh, you see on the slide the neighborhoods and the current numbers. In six of the eight neighborhoods, we do see the numbers continue to go up. We have seen some fluctuation by neighborhood. We know, uh, and we've seen it previously in other areas like uh, Sunset Park and Soundview, the numbers can change rapidly in the right direction. So we're gonna keep working daily, hourly to make that change. But right now, in six of the eight neighborhoods, we see unfortunately an increase and now the neighborhood of Kew Gardens has surpassed that 3% level we're watching carefully. We're continuing to monitor four additional zip codes that are lower, but we want to be very careful because we've seen some increases. We want to arrest the problem in those areas as well. We'll be continuing to send resources to them as well. That includes Rigo Park, Kensington Windsor Terrace, Brighton Beach, Manhattan Beach, Sheepshead Bay, and Williamsburg. Now, today, we'll have a number of uh, initiatives today. 400 plus police officers will be out in these communities providing information, providing free masks, reminding people that they are required to wear masks, and obviously in the case where there is non-compliance uh, issuing summonses. 400 from the NYPD, 250 uh, compliance officers from other city agencies and uh, approximately 300 members of the Test and Trace Corps. So almost a thousand City employees will be out in these target zip codes uh, doing uh, distribution of masks, information, and when necessary, compliance work. Yesterday, team distributed successfully thousands and thousands of masks. We saw good compliance when uh, folks were uh, encountered, when there was a discussion. We saw a very high level of compliance. No summonses were necessary yesterday. We would love to see that continue, but obviously prepared to issue summonses as needed. Sheriff's Department also uh, yesterday visited over 130 non-public schools to ensure that rules were being followed. So that's a key piece of the equation. There's going to be by the Sheriff and Office of Special Enforcement intensive uh, outreach going to businesses as they have been over the last few days, going back to businesses where there are instances of non-compliance. A reminder, businesses can be fined or shut down. So there'll be individual work throughout the community going business by business, hopefully finding good conditions 
where there are not good conditions. If they have not been the problem before, there'll be a warning. If there has been a problem before, a business can be fined or shut down on the spot. So that effort will continue with those compliance agencies. And then rapid testing, uh, the rapidly increasing, I should say, the amount of testing in the area. 11 mobile testing sites have been moved into the cluster areas, tripling the capacity of the health department's express testing sites and a new initiative, which Dr. Katz will explain, a positive phrase being used, block parties. These are areas where streets are closed off and a high level of testing can be done in mobile testing units. And we want to encourage community members to come out and participate with that. That amount of testing will continue to increase daily over the coming days in these neighborhoods. We're also working with community-based organizations of all kinds to get the word out, multiple languages, let people know how important it is to get tested, how important it is to wear masks and to socially distance. Uh, we have uh, robocalls being made. We have sound trucks out in communities spreading the message in multiple languages. All of this can help, will help, is helping. Now, it's also really important to note that community leaders have been extremely helpful in this effort. I want to thank the many, many community leaders. I've been on numerous uh, group conference calls and calls with individual leaders of the community over the last week. I know Dr. Katz, Dr. Choksi, many others have spent a lot of time working with community leaders on the right way to address this challenge. A special thank you to a beloved member of our team, Penny Ringel, who works here in the mayor's office and has done extraordinary work with the community. I get many thank yous from community members for his tremendous outreach efforts to help people know what they need to know and how to act on it. So uh, a lot of work with community leaders and institutions and tremendous support from those organizations getting the word out that real action needs to be taken by each and every member of the community to help address this challenge. A special thank you to elect officials who have stepped up. And there is an op-ed today in the community newspaper Hamadia, which I have known for many years and been interviewed by many times. Uh, and it's very clear, it's a very powerful, straightforward op-ed about the importance of wearing masks, of getting, uh, following the rules, getting tested. So many key messages addressed well and powerfully in this op-ed. So I want to thank State Senator Simka Felder, Assemblymember Simka Eichenstein, Assemblymember Daniel Rosenthal, Councilmember Chaim Deutsch, and Councilmember Kalman Yeager, all of whom joined together with a unified voice to say to the community how important it was for everyone to be part of this effort to turn back this challenge. With that, I want you to hear now from the man who's been leading uh, this effort in so many ways and working so closely with the community, and Dr. Katz. I have to tell you, uh, there's a lot of concern, there's a lot of need, but on many, many conversations I've had with community leaders, they take time to say thank you for your involvement because they know you know the community, you care about the community. It's very uh, personal and real for you, but also the leadership you're providing as one of the healthcare leaders of this city is appreciated by all. So thank you for that, and we welcome your update. Mayor, uh, we're very pleased that in these neighborhoods, uh, yesterday we had more than 350 people on the ground handing out masks and distributing literature, reminding people of the four core ways that we stay safe, we stay home if we're sick, we keep physical distance between us and others, we limit indoor gatherings, we wear a face covering, and we practice healthy hand hygiene. And that's to protect ourselves, to protect our parents and our grandparents. Uh, as the mayor has said, testing, testing, testing. And he has told us to do everything possible to increase the amount of testing that's available so that we have a full picture. And if people are infected, we can safely isolate them and get them the treatment that they need. Uh, so the mayor mentioned the 11 mobile testing sites, rapid testing sites at three health and hospital sites in Queens and Brooklyn, and enhanced capability at two health department sites. But I'm very excited, the mayor alluded to this, as a kid, a block party was the most exciting thing in South Brooklyn. I mean, the, the day of your own block party, which for me was East 19th Street between W and X, but of course, because we had bicycles, we had the ability to go to everybody else's block parties. And we so much enjoyed them, and I think it's a very positive use 
of that phrase because now we're going to do block parties where we're going to shut down portions of the street and sidewalks and set up large uh, testing tents. Uh, we will be able to test up to 500 people in each uh, tent or site, and anyone who gets tested will get their results back in 24 to 48 hours. Um, we're going to keep announcing additional block party sites so that we can saturate uh, these zip codes. They'll be supervised by clinical staff who will also be able to offer people self-administered tests. Uh, New Yorkers will be able to pick up a test, uh, take a swab uh, on the inside of their nose themselves for 10 seconds, put the swab in a tube, seal it and hand it to somebody who is supervising at the table. They will get the results in 48 hours. Uh, we're also partnering with our community boards to implement uh, these microsites. Each microsite can manage 100 tests per day. And finally, we are distributing rapid testing machines uh, to trusted providers in the affected neighborhoods. Uh, sir, as you know, I was on the phone last night with a group of physicians uh, who, are, who take care of patients in these neighborhoods, and they were saying, get me testing, get me testing. And because of your commitment, I was able to say, we're going to provide these machines uh, to doctors' offices so that they can do a rapid point of care. Each machine uses a nasal swab test, delivers results in uh, 20 minutes or less, and these are PCR tests. One of the concerns that the doctors raised are, are you using antigen tests because we're worried about false positives? And I said, no, these are pure PCR tests. Uh, and people felt very happy knowing that. Uh, the virus is insidious. Many people are asymptomatic and don't know they're infected and can spread the disease. Increased testing helps us to identify these people. So Mr. Mayor, thank you for giving us the resources that we need to do the job. Thank you very much, Dr. Katz. Thank you to you and your whole team. Uh, everyone on our healthcare team is working so hard and working so closely with the community. And again, the message today is go out and get tested. Whether you're in one of these key zip codes or any place else in New York City, get tested so we can get the full picture of what's going on and you can get the full picture of what's happening with your own situation. The testing, again, in this city, results are coming in much faster than they were uh, several weeks back, and it is an easier process than ever. So important. So again, constantly people say, what can I do to help? How can I help New York City? You can help New York City by going out and getting tested today and taking that brief amount of time to make a big difference. Now, a lot happening in the city today, and another important topic, obviously, as we continue to come back as a city continue to bring jobs back, continue to bring people back, bring people their livelihoods back, is the restaurant industry, which has gone through so much and stood so tough through this crisis. Obviously, important news in the last few days, we announced that uh, outdoor dining, our uh, outdoor restaurant initiative, open restaurant initiative will be made permanent that our open streets initiative and that combination of open restaurants and open streets will be made permanent. These have been a huge step forward, not just for the restaurant industry and the, the hundreds of thousands of people who work in it, but for the city as a whole. This is a new approach that will make this a better city. And uh, some people like to allege that New York City is a quote unquote ghost town. I would urge those people to go see the booked solid outdoor dining all over the city that's been such a success. And I congratulate everyone in the re restaurant industry for achieving that and bringing back all those jobs. But now this is the first day when you'll start to have indoor dining again. Now, let's be clear. This is something that was worked on very carefully by the state and the city and we'll start at a low level, 25% capacity. It's crucial, of course, to bringing back more jobs and helping businesses to survive, but health and safety as always come first. So there will be very clear conditions and restrictions and rules here. And a lot of communication has happened with the restaurant industry to make sure everyone understands that uh, temperature checks must be conducted at the front door for anyone going in for uh, indoor dining that tables must be spaced six feet apart, and bar tops are not going to be allowed for seating. Uh, so there's clear conditions about the kinds of PPE uh, that must be available for employees. Uh, 
obviously crucial that information is kept carefully by the restaurants in case there is, God forbid, a situation where follow-up is needed, that the Test and Trace Corps will have the information needed. So I believe the restaurant industry has heard these messages loud and clear, and of course, we will have a lot of information out there over these next days to the industry and inspectors out going forward. But the inspection effort is going to focus now on these zip codes in Brooklyn and Queens where we're seeing the particular uptick. So I want to make that clear today. There's going to be a very rigorous inspection effort in those zip codes. And we're going to be looking carefully to make sure every restaurant is following the rules. Uh, look, if we see the kinds of uh, violations that create problems, like employees not wearing a mask or a violation of the 25% limit, if an, a restaurant has more than 25% capacity with its diners, or if we see alcohol being consumed at a bar, those are the kinds of things that will lead to immediate summonses. And again, we want to have a situation where everyone follows the rules and no one is penalized. We certainly don't want to see any restaurants shut down. But we need to be very rigorous everywhere in the city, but particularly in the zip codes in Brooklyn and Queens where we're having a problem right now. So you will see uh, health department inspectors and other personnel out in those restaurants starting today and tonight. And they'll be very focused on making sure everyone is following the rules. Also, work going on with small business services and other agencies to get the word out. We want to support this industry, but it has to be done safely. And I know, as always, restaurant owners and employees have questions as we continue to move forward. Anyone who needs information can go to nyc.gov slash restaurant opening. I'm sorry, restaurant reopening. My apology. nyc.gov slash restaurant reopening to get the information you need. It has been a long journey back, but it has been working. The industry has played a crucial role in the rebirth of the city, and we're going to make sure that continues. Now, let's talk about another reopening, school reopening. Again, uh, as the Chancellor and I have said more times than I could count, uh, it's about health and safety. By the way, as you see in that picture, our kids are doing their share. And when the Chancellor and I were at the Island School yesterday on Houston Street, we saw it. We saw it the week before out in Elmhurst at the Mosaic Pre-K Center. Uh, Four-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, every age, kids wearing their masks and doing it very naturally, honestly, and adults as well, and social distancing being respected. We also saw kids really happy to be back in school with the teachers they love, with their friends, and we saw a lot of adults uh, with tears in their eyes too, tears of joy that they could see the kids they love again. And the re the seeing everyone reunited was really, really powerful. I wanna just give you an update on yesterday a uh, big step forward because we had, as of yesterday, 870 schools open in New York City. So we went through the first step with pre-K, 3K, and District 75 special ed schools. Yesterday, K-5, to K-8 to schools. As of this morning, 870 schools open in New York City with in-person learning for the children. Uh, yesterday went very well. Uh, we checked. I had meetings at the Department of Education, talked with our labor partners consistently got the message that things went well and smoothly. Thank you to all our educators and staff. This was a big, big effort. And the folks at the Department of Education, including everyone who works at the Tweed Building headquarters, I want to commend you all. This was a tough effort, a big, complicated effort. But yesterday, we moved forward in a very big way, now at a level that no other school system in America is, with 870 schools open for in-person learning. But tomorrow, we go much farther, middle schools and high schools open, at which point tomorrow morning there will be 1,600 schools open, 1,600 public school buildings open and serving children and families in New York City in addition to over 1,000 community-based pre-K and 3K sites. So a really extraordinary uh, number of schools will be open and ready to serve and they're doing it the right way. Thank you to our educators, to our staff, to all the DOE leadership, to our parents, and to our kids, because you're all together making this work. Now, let me give you another update, because again, it seems like so much is happening at this point. The census, what's going on? Well, today was going to be the last day to be counted in New York City. And if you have not been counted today, if you haven't filled out the form, today's a good day to do it. 
But we have a federal district court in California that has overruled the deadline and called for a one-month extension to the original concept. It's still in the court system. We don't know what the final disposition will be. We do know that everyone can do something right now because regardless of what's happening in the courts, the facts on the ground matter. So if you haven't filled out the census, do it right now. It takes all of 10 minutes. Uh, right now, New York City has a 60.8% response rate, 60.8%. We, that's, a, that's a very impressive number given that this all happened during a pandemic, but we have to get it higher. So the simple message is while we're waiting to see what happens in the court system, we're going to continue to do this work, continue to reach New Yorkers, especially today. Please go online, my2020census.gov, or call 844-330-2020. Okay, now we'll do a few words in Spanish. Hoy anunciamos que se puede comer dentro de los restaurantes de la ciudad de Nueva York. Los restaurantes tienen que seguir estrictas medidas de seguridad, incluyendo distancia social y menos mesas. Queremos que más personas puedan volver a trabajar en los restaurantes y ganarse la vida de forma segura. With that, let's turn to our colleagues in the media. Please let me know the name and outlet of each journalist. Hi, all. We'll now begin our Q&A. As a reminder today, we're joined by Dr. Shachki, Dr. Katz, Chancellor Carranza, Commissioner Doris of the Department for Small Business Services, and Senior Advisor Dr. Jay Varma. The first question today goes to Andrew from WNBC. Good morning, everyone. Mayor, I wanted to ask, uh, the UFT has uh, made it known in a letter that if you can't turn the numbers around in, in some of these danger zip codes, they would like key schools, I think as much as 80 of them, as many as 80 of them, to be closed while the numbers are this high. I'm wondering, uh, how close are we to that point where you would need to close down schools in these targeted zip codes? Uh, it's a good question, but I want to give you a clear answer, Andrew. Uh, I've obviously talked to our union colleagues. I'm familiar with their concerns, but what we're doing is making our decisions based on data, based on science. And we have something now that we did not have uh, back in March or April, which is the situation room that is watching every school every day. We have very precise data on what is happening in each school. We we'll obviously have asked the question, what are we seeing with the schools in those zip codes? What are we seeing with members of the school community who work in a school uh, in any part of the city but live in those zip codes? And the answer is the same in both cases. We are not seeing any unusual uptick among any of them. I will say it again. We have a very unusual situation here where we have an uptick in a discrete set of zip codes and we are not seeing an interconnection to our public school system. So we will watch it very carefully, daily, hourly, and if at any point we determine we need to close an individual school or any number of schools in that area, we will. But today, based on the facts, it is not warranted. Go ahead, Andrew. My second question has to do with your new enforcement efforts in these, uh, in these zip codes. You mentioned this morning, I believe you said 400 NYPD officers will be part of this mix. Yesterday, Governor Cuomo uh, pointed again to the fact that so many NYPD officers don't wear their masks themselves. I'm wondering if this point you find that perhaps some of the reticence on mask wearing comes from the fact that New Yorkers see poor modeling from their own police officers who are out on patrol not wearing masks day after day. Obviously, I've had this conversation with Commissioner Shea, and I know he's sent very clear instructions repeatedly to the men and women of the NYPD. And from my observation, going around the city, uh, the vast majority are, in fact, wearing masks. But I think the answer is simple. Uh, our officers should be held to the same standard as all citizens, all public servants. Uh, unless there is a good reason, like you know, stopping to drink water or having to do something in which a mask interferes with them doing their job, uh, our officers should be wearing their masks. If they don't, there should be penalties. It's as simple as that. And the NYPD has the tools to implement those penalties, and they should. I don't want to see that happen. I, I would just prefer all our officers to 
follow through on these instructions that the commissioner has given. But if anyone doesn't, there should be penalties. Next up is Ravain from Hamodia. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm, giving, just, you, I'm giving you promotion today, Ruvain. I'm, I'm going to help oh, Hamadia have more subscriptions. Thank you, thank you. I actually, 30 seconds ago, H&H &H uh, texted me that my uh, COVID test was negative. Ah, congratulations. But, uh, thanks. I wanted to ask, uh, you mentioned that, the, that these hundreds of people that are going into the neighborhoods, part of what they're doing is to providing information and combating disinformation, but you didn't elaborate on that. So I'm wondering if you or the doctors can elaborate on uh, what sort of disinformation um, these, uh, these people are combating. Yeah, I'll turn to Dr. Katz with this simple point. I think throughout this crisis, now seven months, uh, you have heard all over the city, all over the country, people saying, oh, you don't need to wear a mask, or oh, COVID is a hoax. And I think Dr. Katz got a very personal and inappropriate example of that, what he experienced last Friday. And I'm sorry he experienced that. He did not deserve that. Um, but we've heard that everywhere, and we have to combat that with just the pure scientific facts. Dr. Katz. Thank you, sir, for the opportunity. The, the most common and most pernicious misconception I've heard is that the virus has changed, that it's not as lethal as it used to be. And that is not at all true. The, what we do know is that because we've been much more successful at protecting people in nursing homes, we have not had the number of sick people who are very disabled. So the, while the COVID cases are somewhat younger, but as sadly occurred with my father-in-law who died, he was 72. The COVID was not any gentler than it was in March and April to him. And so we have to keep reminding people the virus has not changed. Uh, there, the epidemiology is a little different with younger people uh, being infected. Um, so that it's not, the numbers do not look as bad, um, but even young people have succumbed to this virus. Uh, a second one I hear a lot is herd immunity, um, that we don't need to wear masks because we have herd immunity. There's no neighborhood that has herd immunity. Uh, and so people definitely uh, need to wear a mask. Um, and then finally, I've heard that the tests are not accurate. And I think actually what that is, is confusion about the different types of tests. The PCR tests that we're offering at all our sites, whether it's rapid PCR or whether it's a PCR people are getting in 24, 24 to 48 hours, the results of those are accurate tests and people should believe the results. I'm glad your test was negative. I'm also pleased um, that you got, it, you got the result by text. That would have been an unimaginable thing for health and hospitals to accomplish three years ago. So I'm very glad that not only you got the result, but you got it in a modern way. Excellent. Thank you. Go ahead, Ruben. Yeah. Thanks. The test was at the park there uh, last Friday, by the way. Uh, my, my other question was about the, the testing rates. I know that in many of these zip codes, there are very high antibody rates, and I'm wondering if that's leading um, to fewer tests. Are people with antibodies less likely to test, and is that somehow affecting the positive test results? I'll start as the layman and turn to Dr. Katz and Dr. Choksi. Look, uh, I think the truth is there's a huge percentage of New Yorkers in every neighborhood who have never been tested. And uh, it is a very good question. I appreciate the question whether if there's a high percentage of people who have tested positive for antibodies, they're not going back and getting tested. I, that would be understandable. But remember, uh, we don't have all the facts on this disease, and simply having tested positive at some point in the past is not a reason to never get tested again. And Dr. Katz and Dr. Choksi can elaborate on that. I would go to the simple point, Ruben, that there are so many people who have never been tested once or haven't been tested in a long time. So I think there's plenty of people to uh, reach out to to help us get a clearer picture. And what I'm saying to everyone in these zip codes and to everyone in the whole city is help us get the truth. The more people get tested, the better picture we'll have. There is nothing to be afraid of in getting tested. It only helps us get to the truth more quickly. 
and not just see a small number of people and get a misimpression from that, but get the biggest cross-section of the community possible. Dr. Katz. The mayor has said it right. The, the groups we really want to go for testing are people who've never been tested or haven't been tested in a long time. People who had documented COVID infections within the last two to three months, that is a group of people where if they're currently asymptomatic, it's not helpful to us for them to get tested. Um, but the vast majority of people uh, have never been tested or have not recently been tested. They haven't had COVID. Those are the people we want to go out and get tested. Dr. Chalks, you want to add? Uh, yes, sir. I'll, I'll add briefly. But first, let me um, say thank you to uh, Ruvain for what you have done to combat the disinformation that we're seeing uh, as well. And it very much relates to your good question about um, who should get tested. Uh, I agree with the points that the mayor and Dr. Katz have made. Um, what I would emphasize is that because we are, uh, we are not seeing any evidence of herd immunity in these neighborhoods, that means, uh, unfortunately, there are still so many people who are susceptible to the virus. Um, and those are, are the ones uh, that we want to get tested because, let's focus on the facts, we are seeing an increase in cases among those susceptible people. Uh, so um, hence all of our uh, focus and efforts around uh, ensuring that testing is as widespread and available as possible. Thank you. Next up is Juan from New York One. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm very good. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about the uh, ballot uh, situation that we have in uh, Brooklyn, right? The governor wants a board of elections to just send out new envelopes, not new ballots to voters who got the wrong ones. Do you think that's the best way to remedy this situation? And do you think, uh, what do you think about the governor uh, getting into the, uh, this fight? Look, the board of elections, I wish that the board of elections was a city agency. Uh, you know, I have mayoral control of education and so many other key uh, parts of the city government where we can make sure there's actually accountability and that we serve people here. The Board of Elections, the city government does not control, and it's incredibly frustrating because they make so many mistakes and they're so unresponsive to the people, and it's a very political organization, not a government organization, and it is responsible only to the state of New York. So obviously, it's not wrong for state officials to issue their opinions. I would ask the state, all the state leaders, to change the Board of Elections once and for all, to just create an entirely different structure. Either make it a mayoral agency so we can properly administer elections, or come up with some other kind of model where it's modern and professional. But what we have now is not working, and the state has not acted to change that, and that is why we have the problem year after year. It is the state's responsibility to fix the Board of Elections, period. As to the specific question about the ballots, look, there's more than one way, I'm sure, to solve the problem, but what we need to make sure is that people have the accurate ballot for their community, for their neighborhood, for the people they should have a choice to vote for, and they know where to send it back, and everything makes sense. Whatever will get that done, I want to see it happen quickly, and I'd like to see the maximum communication. Uh, if it were a city agency and I controlled it, I would not only say send out new ballots and new clear instructions, I would have follow-up phone calls to make sure people receive them and they confirm they got them and if they had any questions, we answer them. There should be a very hands-on approach here. Uh, I've never seen that from the Board of Elections. That's what we need now. Go ahead. And uh, Mr. Mayor, are you planning on going out and dine indoors today or any time uh, this week? So what I'm going to do for sure in the coming days is continue as I have to enjoy outdoor dining first while the weather's still good. Uh, I have had great experiences starting with Melba's up in Harlem and I was up at Mario's on Arthur Avenue, which was fantastic, 100 year old restaurant. Um, so the, my outdoor dining experiences have been amazing. I'm gonna keep doing that for the foreseeable future. And then, of course, shift to indoor uh, when the outdoor isn't as prevalent because of the weather. So the important thing, and I'd say it to all New Yorkers, if you have the resources, please get out there and support our restaurant industry today. Whether it's outdoor or indoor, get out there and support our restaurant industry. 
Next up is Katie from the Wall Street Journal. Well, hey, good morning, everyone. Um, I have a question, an education-related question for you, Mr. Mayor and the Chancellor. I've heard from parents who say that um, despite their children having IEPs that um, mandate speech and, and other related services, their schools have told them that they just don't have those teachers. So I'm curious if you want to speak about how prevalent this is across the city, uh, given the fact that this is a vital service. I don't think you'll, you'll argue with me on that and why the DOE is not providing it. I'm glad you raised it. And if I'm not only not going to argue with you, Katie, you've, to your great credit, you've raised these issues constantly. And I appreciate you being a champion for the families who need this support. They've gone through a lot before the pandemic, and it's even been harder for them during the pandemic. Uh, so the chancellor will have the details, but I want to affirm we have to get it right for each and every one of these families, even with all the challenges we are facing. Chancellor. Yeah, so Katie, first and foremost, any family should be in communication with their school community. So whether that's a principal or it's a specific uh, coordinator of IEP services, they should be doing that uh, as we speak. Uh, if you can share any information specifically about any of those families, we'll make sure that we are, are in touch with them ASAP. They are part of the highest priority of students that we know have uh, been disproportionately affected through remote learning. So we're doing everything we can to make sure that they have the services, uh, and especially if they've chosen in person, that they have those in-person services as well. So again, as the mayor and I have talked about, we're, we're restarting this massive system. So it's taking a little bit of time to get all the pieces in the right place, but we wanna make sure that the students that need the most support get it as, as soon as possible. Thank you. Go ahead, Katie. And my second question is about mask compliance in neighborhoods, particularly the nine higher zips. Um, how do you guys calculate this? I don't know if there's, there's not the data on it. It seems purely anecdotal when, you know, Dr. Katz and others say that they've seen better mask compliance. Is there like a way that you quantify this? Do you count? Do you do like a ticker where you spend a few hours? Could you explain? I'll start and turn to Dr. Katz. It is exactly based on city officials being out and keeping track of what they are seeing and the interactions they have. And again, today we're gonna to have almost a thousand city employees out in these target neighborhoods to make sure we are providing that support. Go ahead, Dr. Katz. Uh, so yes, uh, it, it's people actually watch, they station themselves to observers at a corner, they watch people go by and the, the raw numbers do show improvement. I, I'll give you a minute. Uh, to plug wearing your mask correctly. Uh, so that was, I noticed, an interesting thing that the observers not only are get data on are people wearing masks, but are they wearing it correctly, which is two different problems. People who are not, who are wearing the mask, but are not wearing it correctly, they're trying, but obviously they don't know. The goal is that the mask needs to cover your, your mouth and nose, and contrary to the belief of some New Yorkers, you actually can talk on a cell phone while wearing your mask. I have talked to the mayor many times wearing my mask um, on the cell phone. So, so please, uh, beside, now that we've convinced people to wear a mask, it does need to cover your nose. And yes, you can speak on the telephone while wearing it. I will, I will affirm Dr. Katz's point. I've talked to Dr. Katz many times uh, on the cell phone while wearing a mask. It absolutely can be done, and it really needs to be done for everyone's health and well being. Next up is Julia from the New York Post. Hey, good morning, Mr. Mayor. How you doing? Good morning, Julia. How are you? Good. Um, just following up on Andrew's question, um, you're going to kind of wait until the, the weather gets cooler to dine indoors. Um, are you concerned about the message that signals to other New Yorkers and the help that the industry needs right now getting back to its feet if you're not willing to do it? No, I didn't say not willing, and I'm not concerned about the message. I'm saying I personally just prefer outdoor dining, and so long as it's available, I would always choose it. I think there's lots of people who are going to love the opportunity to dine indoors, and they'll have that opportunity. So the important thing is that the restaurant industry is coming back, coming back strong, that folks who have the means, and a lot of people don't right now, but thank God many people do, should go out there and support restaurant workers and restaurant owners. And if you prefer outdoors, go outdoors. If you prefer indoors, go indoors. Go ahead. 
There's a video of a large gathering on a street in Borough Park last night without any social distancing, and it appears um, very little mask wearing. Are you or the health officials on the call aware of the incident, and, and was there any enforcement? I am not. I'll turn to my colleagues, but what we will do in any case like that is follow back to who was involved, how can we reach those people, or if we expect any recurrence to make sure we have personnel out to address it in advance. But doctors, any sense of this? No. I, I have okay, not. We'll, we'll look into that and make sure our team follows up with you with uh, further detail. Next up, we have Jillian from WBAI. Hey, Mr. Mayor, how are you? I'm good, Jillian, but we have a problem with your innovation here. We have a little confusion, <laughs> a little confusion at the I federal know. level. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm digging the uh, question marks. Uh, so I want you to know, the first question is, is being asked in all due respect. The state just froze pay raises a third time, and you've extended the city's furlough to include managerial and non-represented employees. Going a step further, you have a history of awarding your staff lucrative raises, as well as hiring more special assistants. Between two, 2016 and 2019, three of four years amounted to cumulative raises of more than $2 million alone, and the number of special assistants has increased by more than 100% since you took office. These raises are usually awarded at the end of the fiscal year, which just ended in June. Given the city's financial situation and the prospect of mass layoffs, can you say with certainty no raises will be given within the next year? And will you be reducing the number of special assistants, many of whom earn more than $100,000 a year? So, Jillian, let me try and address that, different pieces you're raising there. Uh, the state has an entirely different structure than we do in terms of the way they freeze uh, pay raises. Um, they have different labor rules than we have, those kind of things in terms of the vast majority of our workers would, of course, have to be done through collective bargaining. In terms of the mayor's office, as I announced, I think it was last week or the week before, um, not only are we doing the five-day furloughs uh, for me and all other appropriate mayor's office personnel, but the budget of the mayor's office has gone down now 12 percent since uh, the June budget, meaning from last year to this year, down 12 percent. And we're going to continue to find savings. So what we have done is actually reduce the number of jobs here overall. Uh, there's no raises being given that I know of. There's no plan to give raises. There are people who take on new, entirely different jobs, and that's a different matter when you go into an entirely new job. But no, there's no plan to give raises at all. Go ahead. Thanks. Thank you. Um, you were asked a rather incomplete question last week about development and if Democrats were being too anti-development, when in fact, I think most of us know party affiliation tends to be irrelevant in such matters. In your response, you cited three projects the city is still pursuing, but you didn't talk about the very controversial rezoning proposal for the Crown Heights area surrounding the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens. While there's much to ask about this project, my main question today has to do with the fact in 1991, so during your mentor, David Dinkins' administration, the city conducted an analysis and an EIS, including shadow study, determining, determining the area must have height limits to protect the garden and that more than 12 stories will be detrimental with shadows cast over it. And the city put into place height restrictions. So what has changed since the Dinkins administration concluded the garden would be at risk by nearby development because the private project the city and DCP currently support uh, includes at least a 39-story building to which your own parks department objected in December in a 13-page memo? Well, you have done your research. Uh, I need to do a little more of my research on what uh, city planning is thinking about that specifically. Look. I think it's quite clear that the work that was done almost 30 years ago uh, was for that moment in history, and we're in a very different moment in history where I, I would can tell you, having been in this building in 1991, if you told me the city would grow from that time to now a million or more people, 
and uh, that we would have the kind of huge crushing need for affordable housing that developed over those decades and the kind of population plus the rising cost of living and property values. I, I would not have believed you in 1991 if you told me that we would get upwards of 8.6 million people and that um, the cost of renting an apartment would go so high, I just would not have believed you. So I would say that the assumptions then versus the assumptions now are very different. And the position we've taken all along is where development benefits the larger community in terms of affordable housing and other needs, uh, that's where we're open to it and where it doesn't, we're not. Uh, the cases you're talking about, uh, that um, there's a couple of different issues around the Botanical Garden. Those are private applications. Those are not city-sponsored. But I will look into the specifics and see what the latest is and have an update for you. The bigger point I want to make to close this piece out is, on the issue of development, we will support pro-community development. This is what I've been saying since long before I was mayor. We will drive a hard bargain with all developers. We're going to demand community benefits, demand maximum affordable housing, demand local hiring. Right now, it can only be done voluntarily. If the legislation we want to pass in Albany passes, it can become a requirement of development. So for everyone out there who thinks developers are getting away with too much, go help us pass this law in Albany so we can require hiring of local community residents and development, hiring of uh, public housing residents, folks who really need that support. We need the legal tools to do it, and it could happen with the stroke of a pen in Albany in a matter of weeks. So what I want to see going forward is that the city continues to have a very high bar on what development we will support and what we won't. And when we don't see developers being generous enough and working with communities, we're just going to walk away from that. And when we do see developers working with communities, we're going to embrace it. I was at one Vanderbilt a couple weeks ago, an uh, exemplary model because $220 million of private money went into fixing the subway system around Grand Central Station. That's the kind of development we can embrace. But it's really up to developers to come forward in that spirit of serving the surrounding community if they want to get the support of the city government. Next up, we have Michael from the Daily News. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, Michael. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Um, so I wanted to, to check in on the situation with the uh, the layoffs we were talking about a few weeks back. Where is the city on that? Uh, I know you've been talking to labor leaders. Um, you know, I, I think the deadline that was given a few weeks back was October first, which is tomorrow. So where, where do things stand now with that? Have, have, have there been any breakthroughs? Um, I know um, early retirement was one. You've been talking about um, borrowing from the state um, quite a bit. Could you just kind of tell us where, where things are now and, and what needs to happen moving forward? Michael, so we're having very productive conversations with labor. I'm not going to speak about uh, breakthroughs until they break through. But when we get something, of course, we're going to tell you right away. But very productive, very specific and substantive conversations with our labor partners. A lot of help from labor uh, pushing the state legislature to act on long-term borrowing. And we're seeing that that is having a real impact. So we continue to focus on that effort. Uh, early retirement, clearly something we want to be part of the package. A lot of details to work through, but we see a lot of a good possibility there. So, uh, can, so long as there is continued progress, so long as we continue to see movement toward the goal, that's where we're going to put the energy. And it's not about uh, tomorrow or any other day. It's about if we can get this done in a positive way, I've said from day one, I do not want to turn to layoffs if there's a better option. And right now, I think we still have the possibility of a better option. Go ahead. Um, so based on that, do, do, you, do you not feel like there's kind of a, uh, a, a time parameter affixed to, to layoffs at this point? Michael, it's a fair question, but let me put it in perspective. Everything uh, can be adjusted according to what the real possibilities are. Look, um, let's start with the stimulus. Uh, as I said to all of you, for months I thought it was essentially a given. Uh, I have more recently felt it was essentially not a given until next year. 
now in the last, you know, 48, 72 hours, suddenly uh, dialogue is happening again in Washington. Uh, who knows? Uh, Long-term borrowing, again, we're hearing more and more support for that in Albany. Uh, that changes everything. I said that from the very beginning. We tried to achieve that back in June. There never would have been any layoffs if we had gotten that back in June or any talk of layoffs. But what's important here is so long as there are more productive options available and more positive options available, we're going to pursue them. If at some point it's quite clear that none of these things is happening, no stimulus, no borrowing, no labor savings, nothing, then we will have to move forward with layoffs with an adjusted figure. But that's just a hypothetical. Well, let's see if these, I think, very promising options play out in our favor for all of us. That would be what's best for the people of New York City and all the people who work for this city. For our last question, we'll go to Abu from Bangla Patrika. Hello, Mayor. How are you? Good, Abu. How are you? Good. Thank you so much. Uh, Mayor, uh, my question is, um, there's a report came that uh, the because last time when, um, you know, the, because of the COVID, the New York City hospitals have a crack, and if second round of SARS came, then it will be earthquake. How prepared you are to handle the situation? Well, Abu, give me a little more there. When you help me understand what you mean about how prepared are we? Abu? Can you yes, um, no, there is a, re there is a report which is the, because of the finances, financial situation of New York City Hospital, uh, if second SARS came, it will be a big a problem because of uh, the financial crisis, city financial crisis. So are you prepared? If anything happened, like a second search, then the city can handle the hospitals? Yes, the answer is yes. Look, we are in a very different position than most places in this country and even around the world. It's a sad reality, and uh, Dr. Varma may want to weigh in because he and I have talked about this many times. Places that have much stronger um, national healthcare systems than we do in this country manage to unfortunately allow the disease back in the door by making, I think, some of the wrong decisions about what to reopen and how to reopen and when to reopen it. Uh, we have been very conservative. So even though we're dealing with a problem in certain zip codes, uh, we also have immense resources we can throw at that problem and help to contain that problem. As you see right now, again, today's indicators, the today's testing number for the whole city, 0.94% our seven-day rolling average, 1.46%. There are places all over this country, all over the world, that would love to have those numbers. So uh, this is about containing the problem and not allowing that larger surge. But if, God forbid, we saw something bigger across the city, uh, we already have put tremendous resources into health and hospitals to strengthen them for whatever is ahead, Department of Health, uh, Test and Trace Corps, uh, these will be the spending priority under any scenario uh, if we had to confront those challenges. But Dr. Varma, just jump in on the point that the difference between the approach this city and to the credit of the state, the state have taken versus what we've seen other places that unfortunately led to resurgence. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the question. I think what's, what's really been critical in New York is, uh, first of all, a all of government approach. Um, you see all of the health agencies, all of the agencies that have any intersection with health, um, really working in concert to take this problem seriously. So that's number one. Uh, number two is um, you see a commitment to continuously driving disease down. Um, you know, a number of other jurisdictions, uh, both in the United States and other parts of the world, um, have essentially um, said, well, you know, the, the we're just going to have to live with, with a, a fairly high level of virus. There's no other way to get through this. Um, the reality is the fastest way to restart your economy is to control the virus. And what you've seen in New York City um, up until fairly recently was very low levels of virus because of all the interventions that have been taken. And the third, of course, is the, uh, the combination of that sort of all-of-government approach, um, a commitment to continuously driving cases down, is only possible when you have tremendous partnership with um, the average person on the street as well as all of the community groups. And I think the, the tremendous unified messaging that you get uh, from government and from community leaders about the importance of social 
of physical distancing, of wearing masks, of limiting gatherings, all of those combined together, I think, to really put us in a position that really rivals many of the large uh, of cities that you see in Asia that have also done a tremendous success with this disease. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Abu. Yeah, second question is, you know, since today the uh, indoor dining is opening and there is a, a, the, the curiosity uh, and also they're scared, some commits, the community as well, that what could happen uh, because there is some, uh, the owners and some people, they are reckless. Uh, could you please specify, beside of the shutdown, the, if someone break the rules, shut down the uh, restaurant or any other store, what is the exact, what is the specific, uh, you know, action um, the city will take if someone break the law? I'll start, and Dr. Choksi can speak to this as well, obviously, because the health department plays a crucial role here. Look. The general approach we've taken throughout the crisis, because unfortunately it is a healthcare crisis and an economic crisis simultaneously, is we, we never want to fine people if we can find a way around it to achieve the same goal without the fine. We never want to shut down a business if we can get the issue resolved without shutting down the business. Um, this is something the city is very sensitive on. Uh, I can't speak for the federal government or the state government. I can say the city believes the best outcome is to solve the problem, not take money away uh, from uh, restaurant owners and restaurant workers or shut down a business that may not survive if it's shut down. But that said, with the challenge we're facing now in these key, these key zip codes, we have to take a very strong approach. So there's been lots of education to the restaurant community of what they need to do. Uh, we, we expect a lot of compliance today. I think people are very sensitive to the realities and very willing to comply. If we find non-compliance, we're going to have to be aggressive, both in terms of fines where appropriate, or even if we had to get to a shutdown, we would go in that direction. But the goal is to avoid that if we can solve the problem and ensure it stays solved. So that's my preface, Dr. Choksi, on the specific approach. Absolutely. Um, and as the mayor has emphasized, uh, when it comes to, uh, to indoor dining and other aspects of reopening, uh, our focus is absolutely on health and safety. Health and safety for the entire city, but also for the specific setting that we're talking about. And when it comes to indoor dining, um, you know, I have to say, as a doctor who has taken care of many patients who are restaurant workers and cooks and other people who will be spending time in those settings, it is very important for us to think both about the health of uh, people who will be going to restaurants, but also the people who are working in them. Uh, and so the many layers of, of safety uh, that are part of um, the inspections and the enforcement that we'll be doing uh, are critical to safeguard that health. Um, that involves making sure that we focus on the capacity limits, so 25% of normal capacity ensuring that there's adequate distancing uh, between the tables within a restaurant, making sure there's robust signage so people know exactly what their responsibilities are uh, when they are there, uh, a cleaning log for every uh, restaurant as well, um, as well as uh, symptom screening both for workers uh, and temperature checks for uh, for people who are going to dining establishments. So all of these things taken together will help us um, reduce the risk uh, for indoor dining. Thank you, Commissioner. And everyone, as we close, look, here's the bottom line. I, I like to be repetitive when it's a good and important message. Please get tested today. That is the message. Wherever you are, whoever you are, wherever you live, please get tested. Uh, this is how we beat back the disease previously. Remember, we were the epicenter. And we fought back and testing was crucial. We have a problem now, we're gonna overcome the problem. I have no doubt we will beat it back, but it, we need everyone to go out there and get tested. I'll tell you something, it's a simple way to think about it. More testing equals more truth. We get the real picture of what's happening and it helps us address it. So again, a thank you to all the community leaders in these zip codes, in these communities that are dealing with this challenge. Thank you to all the leaders who are stepping up and sending a message that tells people how to stay safe, how to protect their families, how to protect their community. Wear those masks, practice that distancing, get tested. And that's how we will come back and beat this back once again. I have no doubt about this city's ability to overcome because we have shown it time and time again. Thank you, everybody.